Um, I'm sorry, I'm dressed down a little bit. I'm going immediately from the podium when we finish uh, to the car to catch my plane because uh, it's a pretty tight connection. So uh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to sign any more books. Um, I'm going to have to go from here right away. But it's good. I'll be able to do this last talk. Um, let's see. All right, we, we lost about five minutes there. So I'm going yeah, to be the auctioneer again. So you have to buckle your safety belts. Okay, um, so I don't miss my flight. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so this, the title of this talk is the most beautiful image in the world, question mark. <clears throat> you might have noticed by now my talks, titles tend to be very bold, right? The second greatest story ever told. Um, last week I was in Denver and I gave it, uh, one of the topics was the greatest passage in sacred scripture. And now we have the most beautiful image in the world, question mark. You can tell I really like superlatives. They're the greatest, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not many got that joke, okay. Well, <clears throat> Um, so the, the question is, the, great, the most beautiful image in the world, um, I'm talking about the image of divine mercy. Now, you know, everybody has different tastes uh, when it comes to beauty, and so uh, that's kind of a bold statement, the most beautiful image in the world. Really, Father Michael? Well, I'd like to give an argument for it. You don't normally argue for beauty. Beauty itself is its own argument, but nevertheless, I want to give a bit of an explanation of why I propose that the, mo that the most beautiful image in the world is the image of divine mercy. To get started there, I want to talk, say something just about beauty in general. Um, beauty, God is beauty. And then all the beauty in the universe, all the beautiful things that we see, the beautiful sunsets that are out here in Florida. I was just in Denver last week, like I mentioned, and they have those beautiful mountains. Those mountains reflect, the, you know, the majestic mountains reflect the power and the majesty of God. Uh, they also had snow out there last week. <laughs> so, you know, the pure snow re represents, you know, the purity of God's love and, and, uh, and reflect his beauty there. But of all the creatures in the cosmos, the creature that reflects uh, God's beauty more than anything is the creature made in God's own, own image, the human person. In fact, St. John of the Cross, he talked about that natural beauty in the world can cause a kind of heart pain. You know, if you've ever looked at a sunset and your heart kind of hurt or, um, and, but he said, beautiful scenes can sort of cause a pain in the heart, a pain of longing, but uh, the, the creature that has the ability to do that most is another human person. Uh, human beings, especially if you have a loved one that you've lost them, it causes a deep pain in the heart. The beauty of another human person, especially when they're, when they're away, uh, can cause a deep heartache. That's St. John of the Cross saying that. Um, but the, the height and the height of beauty of, of the human person is really, I believe, the human face. You know, they say that the eyes are the windows of the soul and that the human face, the countenance, is something that is most... Um, representative of the human person and is, contains the most beauty, the human face. And uh, you can, you've may, maybe seen this or discovered this for yourself. If you've ever met somebody who's amazingly holy, um, you kind of want to just uh, sort of set up camp right in front of them and just, you know, look at their face. You can kind of get distracted. I, I met this, uh, this nun who was a missionary to Russia. And she was extremely holy. And I remember just talking to her I was very distracted. I forgot half the conversation because she was just, it was, she was so beautiful. Her holiness radiated from her face and there was just such a beauty. And if you've ever been around somebody who's extremely holy like that, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But the most beautiful face of all of those faces is the face of Jesus, that Jesus himself is beauty incarnate. He's the most beautiful being in the cosmos, Jesus Christ. He's beauty incarnate in a sense. And you know, I think I, I sometimes get jealous of the apostles because they actually got to spend those years right with Jesus, seeing his face and looking upon his face. And I was kind of jealous of them. And I think of, you know, what an experience it must have been for them 
to be walking around with Jesus, to be listening to him talk and be looking at his face like that, the, this incredible, beautiful, uh, the, the, the beauty of, of the Lord's face. You know, it reminds me of St. Peter when he saw the glorified face of Christ on Mount Tabor that he said, uh, you know, kind of in his, in his confusion at the beauty, he just said, uh, Lord, it is good that we are here. Let me build a tent, right? <laughs> and uh, a tent for all of you guys. He wanted to just stay there, I think, uh, take in that beauty. I also think of like a lot of the mystics in the church who have these, uh, where Jesus appears to them and there's these experiences of, of the Lord that a lot of them talk about that after their experience with the Lord, after the, their, these apparitions, after these uh, mystical experiences, they, they just kind of want to die. <laughs> so they want to go to heaven so they could just see God again. And, and life becomes very difficult after seeing that beauty. Um, and then I, I was also thinking once uh, my, my neighbor uh, there's this woman, Mary, she's since died. She was in her 90s. She was a widow, lived by herself across the street from my family. And I used to bring her Holy Communion. And I remember um, one day I brought her Holy Communion and she told me a story. She said, uh, she's a very holy woman. She spent all day praying the rosary. And she said um, that the previous day she was doing some yard work and moving the hoses and it was kind of vigorous work. And she said she saw like these bare feet in front of her and said in this beautiful voice said, Mary, be careful as you're moving those hoses. You don't want to hurt yourself. And she said, she looked up and she said, it was just like in that picture. And she had a picture of Jesus in the house. She said, oh, he was so beautiful. And she went on to talk about this story. And I thought, oh my God, no goodness, did Jesus speak to her or did she appear? But she was adamant. And it was funny, every time I'd bring her Holy Communion, every single day she would tell that story. She was, and she would always end the story by saying, he was so beautiful. Oh, he was so beautiful. I thought, wow, Mary, that's really special. And, um, and she actually died not long after that. But I, I, I was sort of jealous. I was like, oh, I would love to see the face of Jesus. Um, and uh, let's see here. You know, and in fact, this also, it reminded me of, of uh, this desire to see the, the face and, and the beautiful face. I forgot to mention, my roommate in college uh, and I, we, one of our favorite saints was uh, St. Bernadette Subaru. One of the reasons we love St. Bernadette so much was because she was so beautiful. Um, and not only in life, but even in death. They say the St. Bernadette, uh, her, she, her body never corrupted. She was one, one of those incorrupt saints. And my roommate, uh, his name is Moriel, he went to Nevers in France where uh, her body is there. You could see her face and everything still. And the miracle isn't just that there's somebody who's been dead for 150 years and they're, they're still there. The miracle is the beauty of her face. And uh, I remember my roommate, he, he stayed there actually for three days just looking at the face, hoping that the beauty there would sort of rub off on him as the holiness. But there's something in us where we long to see the face, the beauty and a beautiful face, but especially the face of Jesus. Um, we all long for that. That's when we may be jealous of the apostles that they got to see him or jealous of these mystics, you know, with the holy envy. Um, uh, and it's, I think this is part of why, you know, we all want to see, I think this is part of why uh, in the history of the church there's been these monks who have, you know, done prayer and fasting and then they would do, you know, they would paint these icons or they would write these icons with the hope that, you know, the Holy Spirit would inspire them to, to draw and to write the face of Christ in these icons as a, as a form of beauty for others and a, and a form of prayer. Um, but I think Jesus himself also wants us to be able to see his face. That just as we long to see the face of Christ, and you see, you know, and throughout sacred scripture, especially the Psalms, it talks about like this longing to see the face of God. And we all have this longing to see the face of Christ, but again, Jesus himself, I think, wants us to see his face. And that's why sometimes I think he doesn't wait for pious monks to begin their prayer and fasting and writing the icons, sometimes God himself gives us miraculous images that reflect his divine beauty. I'm thinking, for instance, of the Shroud of Turin. You know, the Shroud of Turin, which was, which was you know, part of, the, it was given in the, and it was, um, you know, venerated even in the early church. Um, you know, some people say, oh, the Shroud of Turin is a, is a medieval counterfeit. I don't believe that. I believe it's the burial cloth of Christ. But that the, the history of it was that Shroud of Turin, it was brought to Antioch, it was brought to all these places, and, and that, that uh, the face, they had folded it so that you could just see the face on the shroud. And it, you can imagine that what a, a consolation, what a, what a great grace that was for the early Christians who had the access to that, that shroud. Um, you also see, if we wait, fast forward way further, in the, 15th, in the 16th century, at the period when there was like uh, six to 10 million 
uh, Protestants were leaving the Catholic Church at the Protestant Reformation. At that same time, the Mother of God appeared to Juan Diego and left that miraculous image on his tilma, which then sort of, as you know, six to 10 million were leaving the church, six to 10 million then began to enter the church in the new world because of all the conversions from Our Lady of Guadalupe. But it was again, it was the beauty of that image that touched hearts, this image not made by human hands and that sometimes God gives us these images to console us and touch our hearts, especially during times of difficulty. Surely the early church needed that face of the, sh the shroud image was helpful for the church, especially as she began the period of the persecutions. Uh, surely that image of Our Lady of Guadalupe was a grace to the church in the period of the Reformation when so many people were leaving the Catholic Church. But then again, it seemed that the, the Lord used the shroud of Turin, the shroud image again, uh, on the eve of the century of tears, as John Paul II, I think, called it, on the eve of that century when there was so much bloodshed, the 20th century, you know, on the very eve of that century, in 1898, there was this man, Segundo Pia. He took a picture, you know, because the cameras that were, it was a relatively uh, new technology back then, and he took a, a photograph of the Shroud of Turin, and when he, when he had the negative, when he developed the negative, uh, as you may know with the Shroud of Turin, the image itself is kind of a negative, so if you have a negative, it makes it a positive, and you can see the face much more clearly. As I looked at that as kind of a, the Lord sort of placed a, a, a special spiritual time bomb to go off in a time we would really need it, with, built into the shroud, so that when the photo, photo, photographic technology came out, we'd see the face of Christ even more clearly. And I imagine that was a great consolation of many people in the 20th century, that in a time of great evil, God's also giving great graces. So. We have these beautiful images and that Jesus himself wants us to be able to see his face. Surely he wants us to encounter his face in prayer, but he gives us also uh, these works of art that really can move our hearts. But again, in our time, in the 20th century and then now in the 21st century, Jesus gave, in my opinion, one of the most amazing and most beautiful of all the images, which I want to talk about now, the image of divine mercy. And again, he gave it on the eve, and I mentioned this earlier, on the eve of some of the worst carnage and bloodshed in the history of humanity in terms of war. He gave it on the eve of World War II when he appeared to St. Faustina in the city of Płock, Poland. And he appeared to her, St. Faustina Kowalska, and, and, and in the apparition, uh, she records what happened in her diary, which I'd like to read to you. She says, in the evening, when I was in my cell, now, she wasn't in prison, it was, she's in the convent, they call them cells, their room. In the evening when I was in my cell, I saw the Lord Jesus clothed in a white garment. One hand was raised in the gesture of blessing. The other was touching the garment at the breast. From beneath the garment, slightly drawn aside at the breast, there were emanating two large rays, one red, the other pale. In silence, I kept my gaze fixed on the Lord. My soul was struck with awe, but also with great joy. And then after Faustina had, had remained some time in this contemplative gaze on the Lord in this apparition, um, she heard these words in her soul. Jesus spoke to her saying, paint an image according to the pattern you see with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. I desire that this image be venerated first in your chapel and then throughout the world. Now that image is the image of divine mercy and St. Faustina, she, you know, with the rays coming out and the prayer, Jesus, I trust in you. And she, and now St. Faustina though, wasn't, wasn't a painter. She couldn't paint this herself. So her spiritual director, blessed Michael Sapochko, found this artist, uh, Eugene Kazimierowski. And, and St. Faustina would meet with Eugene Kazimierowski several times over the course of six months and he would paint the image according to her instructions and it was interesting because every time she went to meet with him she was making him very frustrated because she kept having him change parts of it but especially in the area of the face she would tell him no the brow isn't wide enough the nose is wrong you got to change this and finally after 12 tries this artist uh, she was finally satisfied with with it and said okay that's enough that image is the Vilnius image of divine mercy. It's the original divine mercy image. And so you imagine after Faustina had all this time or working with this artist, making all these changes, she must have been delighted with this image, right? No, in fact, she started crying. Well, she was crying for joy, right? No, she was very sad. As she said, she complained to the Lord in the midst of her tears, 
who will paint you as beautiful as you are? Now, and then Jesus, to kind of console her, he said to her, not in the beauty of the color, nor of the brush, lies the greatness of this image, but in my grace. Okay, so it must be an ugly image, not so great, right? Wrong again. Um, the idea is no image can really capture the glory that is experienced by the saints in their mystical experiences of the Lord Jesus. So naturally, Faustina would be disappointed with anything that, be, that came. But Jesus is making the point that this image still is very beautiful and it's a, it, because of its, the grace that comes from it. The best way I can think of to describe the beauty of this image and why it's so beautiful is if you think of someone like Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Now, Mother Teresa of Calcutta would never have made the front cover of the Glamour magazines, right? <laughs> I mean, with all due respect to Mother Teresa, she wouldn't be on those things, right? I mean, but the idea is nevertheless, many people would agree that she, her face was incredibly beautiful. Not by worldly standards, but because of the grace that emanated from her soul. Because if the face is sort of the window to the soul, and, the, and that soul is full of grace, the, her, you know, her face, even though you know, it's not, um, doesn't have all of the, um, <laughs> uh, the proportions and everything that, uh, that an image would look like on the, on the cover girl, she nevertheless was beautiful. Similarly with the Divine Mercy image. It may not be the most perfect uh, artistic rendition of the Lord because nothing can capture his glory. But nevertheless, Jesus promised that it would be an image full of grace. And, that, and that's, that's where it's, its beauty lies. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, though, some of the graces of this image of divine mercy. Um, because Jesus said, not in the brush and uh, not in the color is the greatness of this image, but in my grace. Well, what does that mean? I want to talk to you about some of the graces, the great graces of the divine mercy image. First, Jesus said to Faustina, talking about the image, he said, I promise that the soul that will venerate this image will not perish. I also promise victory over its enemies already here on earth, especially at the hour of death. I myself will defend it as my own glory. I want to talk a little qu quickly, a quick story about this image overcoming our enemies and uh, not allowing things to perish. Um, there's lots of stories about the image of divine mercy, particularly in Warsaw, during the Warsaw Uprising, where the whole city was destroyed. They would find that some, some houses were still intact, even while everything else had been destroyed. And they went into those houses and they found images of divine mercy. There's a priest in my community who's documented a lot of this, where a lot of times the, the images that are in these houses seem to bring a kind of protection. I look at it as a kind of like in the Old Testament with the, um, the blood of the lamb that was put over the lintel. The angel wouldn't come and destroy uh, the firstborn of that child, but in the image of divine mercy, you've got these, the, the blood and the water uh, present in the house there through the image. Um, but there was this one interesting story. You guys remember, you heard probably about Superstorm Sandy uh, that hit lot last October. Well, there was this fellow named Ron Regalis um, who had a, an image of divine mercy in his house. And when he was evacuated from his house, as he was leaving, he took that image of divine mercy and he, he held it up in the face of the oncoming storm. He had a beachfront house. And he held it up and he prayed the chaplet of divine mercy out loud, made the sign of the cross, put the image back on the mantelpiece in his house, and he had to evacuate. He came back a couple of days later, and he had to park several blocks from his house because of all of the debris, all of the sand, all of the house debris, all of the branches and fallen trees and power lines. So he had to park far away, and, and he had to hike and make his way through all this debris to his house. When he got to his house, he was stunned. While all the other houses were in shambles and all kinds of destruction, his house was completely fine. And he walked, and he, he, he saw, and he looked on his property line, and he saw that the storm surge had stopped right at his property line. And, his, and he knew that because he, he saw it from the debris, but also his neighbor has, had weathered the storm. And his neighbor told him that surely the storm surge stopped right at his property line. None of the trees on his property were damaged. None of the, the shingles on his house. There was no water in the basement. Everything was, was totally fine. And he was convinced that it came from that image of divine mercy. We hear lots of stories like that because Jesus promised great graces through this image. Here's another one. He says, I am offering people a vessel with which they are to keep coming for graces to the fountain of mercy. That vessel is this image with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. Now, 
this, he talks about the image being a vessel of grace. I surely experienced that. I told you I was a professional seminarian. That's a long time. Again, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. It was difficult. But my constant companion throughout all those years was an image of divine mercy. I had all of them. I had the Vilnius, the Hyla, the Skemp, all the different versions. And they were, they were so, uh, such a consolation for me because when the days were dark or difficult, I would look at that image and I would see that prayer, Jesus, I trust in you. And I would see him in the image is with that sort of gentle smile and I would, I would be at peace. And so many times um, I was really, uh, he, he gave many, many great graces from that. Um, one, one in particular that I think is interesting is I, one time I was having a particularly difficult time with my vocation. I thought, Lord, do you really, this is about probably the 12th or 13th year into it. I said, Lord, do you really want me to be a priest? I mean, and I was, um, I was in uh, Vienna actually on a, on a pilgrimage and I was walking, it's a long story, but I was on the streets of Vienna for a meeting. And I was walking the streets and suddenly, like I had been saying, Lord, are you sure I'm supposed to be a priest and I'm not supposed to get married? I mean, it's make things so much easier. Maybe it wouldn't, but, um, <laughs> but I'm going down the street and it was strange because I was sort of complaining to him and I felt like he was, I felt like very strongly in my heart that he was saying that your future spouse is gonna be walking up the street or gonna, you're gonna find her on the street or something like that. It was, it was wordless, but it was this strong. And I thought, oh my gosh. And as I walked the street, I was like, oh, he's gonna let me off the hook, right? <laughs> and just kidding, now that I'm a priest, I love it. I'm, I've never been happier. But at the time when you're in the seminary, you don't experience the joys of the priesthood until after ordination. But um, I'm walking down the street and it's getting stronger and stronger. And I thought, oh my gosh, he's gonna turn around this corner or something, this is gonna be awesome. And it was stronger and stronger, and, I, and it was so strong. I remember I turned, and there was an office space uh, on the street of, it was right in downtown Austria. And within the, in the office space, there was this big image of divine mercy. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh. So, so once again, it's an image of grace. He says, I'm offering people a vessel with which they are to keep coming for graces. <laughs> um, thanks. Then he said, by means of this image, I shall be many, granting many graces to souls. So let every soul have access to it. Let the rays of grace enter your soul. They bring with them light, warmth, and life. Um, the, the, you know, it talks about these many graces. One of the reasons I love the image of divine mercy so much is that I believe my father was healed uh, through the image of divine mercy. I'll tell that story really quickly. Um, when I was, uh, again, I, I, I was uh, that professional seminarian and part of the time when I was in college, um, I was dating this wonderful uh, French girl um, and uh, I broke up with her because uh, I felt called to the priesthood. She eventually became a nun and prays for me. So that's <laughs> all of you guys who are saying, oh, thank you for the writing this book. You can actually thank Sister Bernadette. Uh, her name was Blanche before, but it was uh, really her prayers, I think, that all these graces come from. But um, it was interesting because I had broken up with Blanche and I was there uh, in, in, uh, in Austria, uh, uh, the Steubenville where I went to school. They have an Austria campus. And I was in the chapel and I was all depressed. And I was saying, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Why are you calling me to this miserable life? You know, that I just saw the priesthood as this long, miserable life of horrible, no joy. And I'm wrong. I, I love it now. It's, a, it's such a gift. But at the time, I didn't realize it. And I felt like while I was in the chapel, he said, you know, like what he said to St. Paul, my grace is enough for you. But being the knucklehead from Southern California that I am, I said, well, Lord, it doesn't seem like it's enough for me. You know, <laughs> if you want me to be a priest, you need to give me super graces and like buckets of grace. And I felt like he said, okay. And I said, okay. And shortly after that, I think I found the buckets of grace. It came through a pamphlet that someone gave me on the message of divine mercy. And I was reading it and I was so amazed by the message and the, and the tenderness of the Lord uh, in, uh, this, in this pamphlet talking about, you know, quotes from the diary of Faustina. But I thought, this is too good to be true. There's no way Jesus loves me like this. And so, uh, but it also talked about this Feast of Mercy, Divine Mercy Sunday, and the great graces that would be given on that day. So I decided to test it out. And all day long on Divine Mercy Sunday, I prayed for my dad. I prayed for a chaplet of Divine Mercy for my dad because my dad had been diagnosed with cancer and it was really taking a toll on him. He had hardly any faith at all. He was very depressed. I thought, I'm gonna pray for my dad. So all day long that on Divine Mercy Sunday, I prayed the chaplet of Divine Mercy for him. At the end of the day, I called home back to California. My mom answered the phone. She said, Michael. I said, hey mom. She said, you'll never guess what happened. I said, what? She said, your father went to confession. And I was like, awesome, but I gotta see it to believe it. So I flew back to California at the end of the semester and sure enough, the whole family went to mass together. My mom, my dad, my sister, my brother. 
It was great. But right before mass started, something strange happened. My dad stood up, went to the other side of the church and sat down. I thought, that's kind of weird. So after mass, I said, Dad, can I talk to you for a sec? He said, sure. Now background, my dad is a very salt of the earth, um, uh, kind of rough around the edges. He was a truck driver and a sailor. He used lots of colorful language, you know, but uh, not in church, but he used <laughs> And I said, Dad, can I talk to you for a minute? He said, sure. I said, hey, it's great that you came to mass with Mom, Joe, Heather, and I, but why didn't you sit with us? Why did you get up and move? And he said, all right, Mike, don't tell your mother this. I said, okay. He said, you see, that, you see that picture over there? I said, yeah. He said, you see those rays? I said, yeah. They're doing something to me. <laughs> don't tell your mother. <laughs> and he had, uh, he'd, uh, he'd moved to that side of the church because he wanted to be in front of the divine mercy image. And, uh, and so I was like... Uh, I was like, uh, okay, that's awesome, Dad. A couple weeks later, I, I ran into him. I saw him again, and he said, hey, Mike, i got to tell you something. I said, what, Dad? He's like, look, I was first on the job. And he's like pulled onto the job for a cement truck. Uh, I was first on the job, man. It was early in the morning. I tell you, and the clouds, they opened up, and those, the sun came out, and the rays, they came right in front of my truck. Mike, I tell you, I got on my truck. I stood in those rays. I tell you, they're doing something to me. <laughs> and so uh, he was convinced that the rays of mercy were really doing something to him. Well, I went, back to, I went back to school, but in the meantime, he told my mom, our last name's Gately, and he calls my mom Gate, and he said, hey, Gate, the cancer's not coming back. And she said, oh, Michael, how do you know that? He said, I just know. And uh, sure enough, he went to the doctor, and the cancer had left. And, and, it, hasn't, and it hasn't come back in 15 years, and, uh, and it still hasn't come back in 15 years, but um, he said that he believes that he felt the rays of, from that image were warming the area of the cancer, and he was convinced that the image of divine mercy uh, healed him. Now, my mom, when she finally got wind of all of this stuff, um, she was a bit upset. She said, that's not fair. He's been a knucklehead all these years, and Jesus is appearing to him, and that's not fair. I've been praying the rosary. And, and I said to her, Mom, are you upset that your husband had a conversion and was healed from cancer? And she's like, ah, oh, well, I know why he got that grace. And I said, why? She said, because every morning he'd get up and he would wake up really, really early in the morning. And like, like at three in the morning, two in the morning, he, he, that alarm clock would go off. He'd hit that alarm, sit at the edge of the bed. And the first words out of his mouth were mercy. <laughs> so she said, he's been praying that all these years. And my dad, you know, he really loves the message so much, he eventually wanted to get a tattoo of Divine Mercy on him. And uh, I called him about a year and a half ago, and I talked to him on the phone, and he said, hey, Dad, how's it going? Oh, it's going good. I started working out. I said, why? And he started lifting weights, doing curls. I said, why? He said, because I'm, I'm preparing the canvas for my new tat. So then, then, he, then he found out how much they cost. So he hasn't gotten it yet. But... But the idea is that image of divine mercy, and I can't tell you how many stories I hear of people who have these experiences of divine mercy over and over again. I'm the director of the Association of Marian Helpers, so I get all the letters, and there's so many stories of graces that people experience through this image, as Jesus himself has promised here. So it really is a powerful image of grace. So we've got this image that's really God-given, right? I mean, it was Jesus himself asked for it to be commanded that it be painted. Festina had the artist work 12 tries on the face such that if you superimpose the face of the image of the Vilnius image of divine mercy over the shroud of Turin, it's a nearly perfect ma match. There's more than 90 points of correspondence. For forensic, to, in order to have a match for in forensic science, you need 12 points of correspondence. This has 90 points of correspondence. So it's a near perfect match. So it's this beautiful God-given image, but it's also grace-filled. And so it's the most beautiful image in the world, right? Well, I, would, I almost want to say no, because actually I think in a certain sense the most beautiful image is the image of Christ on the cross, because that's the, most, that's the image of perfect love. That is, no, no greater love has a man than if he give up his life for his friends, and on the cross we see the love, the extent of the love of Christ for us. And then in a certain sense, the cross, the crucifix, is the most beautiful image of the Lord's love for us, or maybe just the Shroud of Turin itself, because it's, it shows the Lord's passion. But the problem is, I think in our time, 
Um, the image of the crucifix doesn't speak as eloquently to people's hearts. The reason I say that is sort of if we go back to the sacred heart revelation. Jesus revealed the, the, his sacred heart to us, to St. Margaret Mary, and it was in the context of him being on the cross. His heart was glowing. And his hope was that he would say, Behold this heart which loves so much, which is spared nothing to prove its love, and yet all it receives in return is ingratitude, indifference, and lack of love. Behold this heart which loves so much, yet which is so little loved. Is there anyone who will console this heart? Is there anyone who will be my friend? His hope was that his passion and this love on the cross would draw people to have compassion on him. And it worked to some degree, but in another degree it didn't work. People were afraid and they avoided Jesus. They avoided his sacred heart. So with the image of divine mercy and the message of divine mercy, Jesus is no longer relying. He's saying, look, these wounded creatures that are so wounded in the modern time because of all of our sinfulness and all of our brokenness, He's saying they're afraid of the cross. They're afraid to approach me on the cross. They're afraid what I might ask of them. And they're, and they're not really letting my, my love on the cross touch their hearts as much. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to them. Faustina, have an image painted where my hand is raised in blessing, where I'm taking a step toward the viewer, where the rays of mercy are going out to them, where it says, Jesus, I scourge myself for you. Jesus, I eat glass for you, right? No. Jesus, I trust in you. Because Jesus knows that we're skittish creatures, that we're ready to take off, as I shared in the, in the, in the previous talk. And so he approaches us gently with, with a small step. That's the image of divine mercy. Um, he steps into our darkness. He doesn't wait for us to go to him. He comes to us in that image. Um, and his eyes, especially what I like about the Vilnius image, is his eyes are sort of downcast, or like looking down so he's not looking right at you, which is a more like so that we're not afraid. They say animals that have been abused, they're very skittish, and that if you approach them and you look right at them, they get scared. So Jesus is looking down. He's taking a small step. The rays of mercy are going out, and he's trying to, to win us back. And so... In a certain sense, the crucifix is the most beautiful image, but for our time, for us wounded modern people who have experienced so much of the brokenness of the modern world, the most beautiful image for us, I think, the one that we're most willing to accept is this image of divine mercy, and Jesus is happy to give it to us. Um, so it's this beautiful, beautiful image. But I'd like to say something now, now that I've, I've shared some things about this beautiful divine mercy image, this most important image for our time, in my opinion. Um, I want, to, I want to talk specifically about the Vilnius image. Now, there's all kinds of divine mercy images out there. They're all beautiful. They're all wonderful. But not a lot of people have heard about the Vilnius image, and that's this image. That's, that's this image. This is the Vilnius divine mercy image. This is the original image that Faustina had painted. It was painted in, it's called the Vilnius image because it was painted in Vilnius, Lithuania, which in Faustina's day was actually in Pol it was in, was in Poland. Um, and it was painted under her direction, as I shared earlier. Well, the problem with this image, the reason you might not have seen this image so, so much, and the reason it hasn't been very popular, I think, is because for years this image was hanging in a church um, in Lithuania over votive candles. That, um, and votive candles, get, candles give off soot. And so the image became very darkened such that people didn't like it because it was too dark and it was difficult to see. So my community, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, in the year 2000, we donated thousands of dollars so that the image could be restored. And it was restored. The problem was the official photograph that we were given to make prayer cards with was dark. <laughs> and we didn't have the technology so much to be able to adjust those things, so we made all these dark prayer cards and nobody really liked them. Um, but then in the year 2008, I was in Poland uh, particularly, and I attended the... Um, the beatification of St. Faustina's spiritual director, Blessed Michael Sapochko. And while I was getting ready to go to the outdoor mass for that, there was these young people handing out Divine Mercy images, the Vilnius image. One of them gave me one, and I started walking to my seat. I looked down in it, and I had to do a double take. I, th I said, where did this come from? It was absolutely beautiful. Um, it wasn't dark like the one that we had. It was beautiful, and I tracked it down eventually. When I became uh, Father Joseph, the director of the Association of Marian Helpers in 2011, I made as one of my top priorities to get the high-quality digital image of the restored Vilnius image. And when we got that, that digital image, we found out that there was actually a lot of imperfections with it. We pulled the colors more. We made some adjustments so that we could see it more in line with the original beauty of the image. And so we created or we, we, we produced this high-quality digital image out in Stockbridge, and I believe it's the most beautiful Vilnius image in the world. I think it's the most beautiful image in the world. I'm, I mean, I know that's bold, but I love it. Um, and the idea is when, when we did that, 
I was so excited. I said, we've got to get this. As Jesus said, let every soul have access to this image. And so uh, I had two guys on my team who were helping. These guys were MBAs. Um, or one was an MBA, another was a businessman who came up to Stockbridge to help me. And I said, look, here's my dream. I want to get this high-quality Vilnius image on the highest quality canvas. So it would be fade-proof, smudge-proof, waterproof, all that. Um, and gallery-wrapped, which is where it's stretched on stretcher bars, right? And, um, and I told them, and I want you to do it for, uh, for under $20. <laughs> and they said, Father Mike, you're crazy. And I said, I know, I know, but just make it happen. And, and they did. If you go online and you look at an I image that's gallery wrapped, proportional to this size, you're going to probably pay about 80 bucks. That's like the going rate for a gallery wrapped uh, uh, canvas uh, art image. Um, this one uh, you, can get, uh, you can get for uh, 19.95 on our website. Here at the conference, you can get it for 20 bucks. Um, but the nice thing here is you don't have to pay for shipping, which is 10 bucks for the, for the gallery wrap. Now, um, but the thing is, is, is that we really wanted that to be a ministry, but in order so that every soul could have access to it, and I didn't want them just to have, you know, the paper image. I wanted them to have a nice one for their homes. And um, so again, they were able to make it happen, but the only way they could make it happen is if we brought the whole uh, process in-house. Unfortunately, we started about five minutes late. Um, I'm going to have to cut some of this. Uh, Let's see. I'll just tell you one thing really quick. In order for us to get it at the really low price, I needed a volunteer labor force. And um, I found one, and then it fell through right at the very end after we bought the equipment and everything. And a, one of our Marian helpers paid for the seed money for us to be able to do this because we couldn't afford it to get it started. But um, I was praying the Lord, and when our volunteer labor force fell through, I said, Lord, you need to send me somebody. And this is what happened. That morning... This young man came to my office, and his name is Eric Mall. Eric Mall used to be a professional football player. He played for the, the, the Cleveland Browns and the New York Jets. He had a conversion while he was playing football, and he left uh, the NFL and joined a hermitage for three years. While he was there, he felt a call to spread divine mercy to the poor. And he also, the Lord told him to go to the National Shrine of Divine Mercy and speak to Father Joseph. Now, my honorary title is Father Joseph. So he came up, he said, I need to speak to Father Joseph. And they said, that's Father Michael. He said, no, I need to speak to Father Joseph. Well, that's Father Michael, just go see him. So he came to see me, and I said, well, we don't do the direct work with the poor ourselves. We supply things to the poor and whatnot, but we're not living in the streets. And he said, okay, well, I feel that's my calling. So I told him about some communities, gave him my blessing. He left. He spent the next year in the streets of Cleveland living in homeless shelters, uh, wet shelters where they were fighting each other and a high and drunk and everything. And he would pray the chaplet with them and he would be with them. And they would say, why are you here? And he said, because God sent me to be your brother. And people say, oh, you want to help the poor? He said, no, I want to love the poor. He's an extraordinary young man. And um, he was on the streets for a year. And at the end of that year, he felt a call to come back to Stockbridge and present himself to Father Joseph again. That was the morning that I was saying, Lord, you need to send me somebody. He came into my office. He said, Father Gately, I know you're a busy man, but I just want to give you something. And he pulls out this image of divine mercy. And I said, Eric, we got to talk. <laughs> Eric has now joined our community as a lay member, and he makes all these images. He prays over them. And uh, he also is my liaison to uh, communities that work with the poor, uh, for the, with the poorest of the poor, so that now we we give these images and we give all these divine mercy images to the poorest of the poor through all these different religious communities. Um, and uh, he is in contact, he organized it, we've been sending it to Haiti. Uh, Eric just went to the Bronx and gave it to a religious community there that works with the poorest of the poor. And the sisters there were so excited because they said, we've been working with these, these poor um, families here in the area and a lot of them are caught up in Santeria, which is this uh, like um, occult practice. And what the sisters do is they tell the people, you give us all of your Santeria paraphernalia and then they destroy it, and then we'll give you these images. And so they've been giving out these images. We've already donated 700 of them to, for those sisters. Um, but I'm, I'm about out of time. So, but if you, want, if you want to help with that project, if you go to our website, divinemercyart.com, uh, there's a section in there for uh, mercy for the poor, and you can help support us with that. I have to leave right after, so if you want to help, I can't be there. Um, but the other thing is... Um, We've also made available, I teamed with this company in California that was making these, have you ever seen those little business card Divine Mercy images with the white border? Well, they now are part of us and they are using now this image and another image that's even more beautiful than that other one. 
they've already distributed something like 45 million of those images. And now we've partnered with them and they said, well, Father Gately, we'll do the distribution for you. We'll do everything, we'll, we'll do all of this. We just ask that you keep our prices. And I said, absolutely, because I just want to get this out there. So if you go to our website, divinemercyart.com, you can get a thousand business card sized Divine Mercy images with the chaplet on the back shipped to your door. So shipping's included for fourteen ninety five. So it's like these prices are, and the neat thing is it helps you to evangelize for divine mercy because you can do hit and runs. You can just give it, say, hey, Jesus loves you and take off. So, um, so if you want to learn more about it, go to the website, divinemercyart.com. Um, also, I've got more images. I have to leave, so I'm not even going to take them with me. So I hope that you'll buy up the last ones. Um, they're really the, uh, I mean, it's really a steal because you don't have to pay for shipping and you get these images for 20 bucks. If we run out, you can go to the website and get them. You have to pay shipping, but at least uh, you still get the image. Okay? All right. Um, let's see. So uh, let's, uh, let's close with a prayer. And thank you guys for the... And I'm not going to be able to stop. So if anybody wants to stop to talk, I'm going to have to just keep walking because I'll, I'll miss my flight other ways. But it was great to be here with you all. And I wish you uh, many, many graces and blessings. Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you all, and may the graces of this retreat stay in your hearts and bear fruit for your lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.